Our family was playing a game this past week. The name of the game is Things. It's a simple game. You write down um, on a piece of paper, each participant, um, one of the things that is described in a card that is read. Well, the card that was read was this, things that are not true. And so we all wrote down our answers and the reader collected them all and um, started going through them. The point of the game is that you try to guess who wrote which um, thing on the piece of paper. Well, we were surprised when we read that one of the things that was written down in response to the card that said things that are not true is this statement, love makes the world go round. Whoever wrote that was saying, this is not true. And our family reacted to them and said, what do you mean? Love does make the world go round. Well, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we are thinking about that very theme, love. Well, human love fails us, but the love of God never does. And so I think it is true that love makes the world go round if we are thinking about the love of God, the most powerful force in the universe. And when we think about Christmas, we think about God loving the world so much that he sent his one and only son into it. And in so doing, his son became vulnerable. Well, that fits perfectly with this truth from C.S. Lewis, who once wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. And what is more vulnerable than a human baby. Listen to these familiar words from Luke chapter 2. It says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. God became a human, but also became a baby, became vulnerable, because he was about to love the world in a way that the world had never known. Through Jesus, his son, God would love the world and change it forever. Our prayer is that he's changing you right now through his love. Well, a baby is vulnerable, but as Jesus grew up, he continued to be vulnerable because he loved his friends. He became vulnerable to betrayal. He became vulnerable to rejection. In fact, he became vulnerable to the judgment of God against all the sins of the world. That's why we celebrate the birth of a baby, because this baby grew up, became the savior of the world. And so welcome to this fourth Sunday of Advent. We are so glad that you joined us at Heritage Christian Reformed Church. My name is Bob Heisman. I'm one of the pastors here. And as we begin, I have a couple of announcements to share with you. First of all, we encourage you, as we have been, to like or comment or share um, what you are seeing today uh, via Facebook or Vimeo and to spend some time discussing it with family or friends. Um, may God's word be a blessing to you today, and may our time of worship draw you closer to him. We also want to give you thanks for your generous gifts given, especially in this month of December. Um, churches and nonprofits everywhere um, receive a large percentage of their annual gifts during this month. And I want to encourage you as a pastor to prioritize your giving to your local church. The local church remains the hope of the world because we continue to spread the good news of Jesus. So please give your gifts online, um, drop them off as many of you have been in the office, drop them in the mail, and we thank you for each and every one. God's people have shown the world what generosity means through time and treasure and talents again and again. So thank you. Also want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, I want to tell you that tonight, on Sunday night, um, we have a Christmas celebration in song and word led by Heritage High School and college students who have attended the Awakening Worship Conference. They put together a beautiful package um, of songs and words that will lift up your heart toward heaven and turn you toward Jesus in this Christmas season. You won't want to miss it. Also, tonight at 6 p.m., this is Sunday night, um, we are going to have a 20 to 30, certainly less than 30, um, minute time of singing Christmas carols outside on the front lawn. Um, with social distance, being outdoors, um, you can wear a mask or not wear one, um, but we encourage you to come and uh, spend some time um, together, but separated enough outside to be safe. 
and to sing some carols together. Um, we're planning on it unless it's raining, um, so no matter how cold, bundle up, wear a hat, put the gloves on, uh, throw a scarf on, and um, be together to sing some Christmas carols. And we put down BYHC, and to me that meant bring your own hot chocolate, your um, hot cider or hot coffee um, with you. Um, COVID has created a lot of cancellations. We were going to provide some uh, hot chocolate for you. And then our servers actually um, came down with COVID. And um, we thought maybe it's just better if you bring your own. So if you can make it, we hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock. And then finally, a big invitation to you to join us um, online on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Um, we have been putting all kinds of extra work into making um, our Christmas Eve, Christmas Day service online as special as the one um, when you have gathered here indoors at 11 p.m. to ring in Christmas Day. Um, we're making it available on our website starting on Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock, so whenever you'd like to gather with family or friends um, to celebrate Christmas, um, you can do that starting 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We're going to premiere it at 11 p.m., the typical time when we would normally meet for our candlelight service. Um, Rob and Stephanie Green have given us uh, full access to their barn, um, decorated beautifully for some of our recordings. You'll see some that are out front and um, by the church um, in front of the nativity. We put to good use our studio. Um, we've enlisted um, a friend and videographer um, to make this time special. So we hope it's a blessing to you, and we hope that you'll share it um, with others because the good news of Jesus is the hope of the world, and that's an easy way to share it in this season. And finally, uh, by way of announcements, um, if you um, still want to submit some artwork, go ahead and do that um, today or this week. And if you get them in by Tuesday, we'll have them available next Sunday. Um, those uh, pieces of artwork or pictures that uh, remind you of the joy of the season or point your heart to Jesus, um, keep turning those in. If you stay tuned to the very end of the service, you'll see some of the ones that were submitted this week. The fourth Sunday of Advent, we're talking about love and God loving the world. These words call us to worship today. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I'm confident today that you are part of that whoever. <laughs> Believe in Jesus and have eternal life. Let us lift up our hearts and praise him together today. of love. Most people understand that by God sending his son to the earth, he was proclaiming his love for the world. But is it possible for any of us to understand and comprehend the depth of his love? With the familiar words of John 3 verse 16 through 17, 
We read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son to con condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God, God's love planned, prepared, and paved the way for the appointed time when Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, a baby born just for us, to save us. Oh, the wonders of his love.
Welcome to Finding God Outdoors. Excited to be with you guys again. Hey, that donkey that we just got to see, that was kind of a makeup from last week. I couldn't find a donkey. Well, I found these donkeys. And just a reminder of the animals that were at the nativity. And we think a donkey was probably there because we know Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem, likely on a donkey. Well, today we're going to be talking about another animal that a lot of people think were at the nativity. In fact, when you look around, you see pictures of where Christ was born. You often see this animal. But today we're going to talk about and ask the question, were they really there? And I'm talking about this big animal called a camel. And we know who rode the camels. We know the wise men. But we're also going to be talking about that and what they brought. But uh, I went out on a little field trip today. And so I'm going to take you with me to a place called Lewis Farms, which is up in New Era. And that's a little bit north, about an hour north of town here. And we went to go check out their camels. So come along. We're going to go take a look at the camels at the Lewis Farms. here at Lewis Farms. What an amazing animal. Jeffrey weighs about 1,400 pounds. We just actually weighed him recently and uh, camel is just an amazing animal. They actually carry an awful lot of weight too. But they're made obviously with a hump and that hump is uh, you know, mostly made of fat. A lot of people think water goes in there but camels can actually drink a lot of water too. So when they live in the desert they have to travel actually quite a distance sometimes. And sometimes these camels can drink up to 40 gallons of water at one time. And so they're able to store a lot of water. Their eyelids are special to protect them from the sand. They can actually close their nostrils so the sand won't come in during a sandstorm. But uh, what an amazing animal. And back in the time of Jesus, when he was born, they were using camels mostly to carry different things. They weren't necessarily all for riding. A lot of the Arabians actually, they rode on horses, but camels can carry an awful lot on their back. I think they can carry up to about eight, 900 pounds. And so just an amazing animal. You know, this one probably stands seven feet up to its back, and I'm sure it can reach up to probably over 10, 12 feet. Uh, but this is quite an animal, and his name is Jeffrey. And, you know, just a huge thanks to the folks here at uh, Lewis Farms who are showing this great place out of New Era. If you want to go see a camel sometime, this is a great place to see one.
Jeffrey, that was a pretty cool camel. He's like 14 years old. Camels can actually live to be about 50 years old. I didn't know that until I met with them. Quigley, however, he is a younger camel, and he was pretty fun seeing him dance around and run around out there. My wife and I, we had a great time heading up there and checking them out. Well, you know what? As we came back, I was thinking more about camels. They're really fast watching them run through there. They can run almost 40 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. They're like a racehorse, but they don't even look like they're trying when they're running around. They're an amazing animal. And we know that story of the wise men, of course. In Matthew 2, we see that story of when Matthew's talking about the wise men or the magi from the east coming. They saw this star, and they knew that because they had been studying about the prophecies of Isaiah that came out by basically 700 years before that, they knew that there was something special that had happened. And they believed that it was the new Messiah that had been born. And so when they came to Jerusalem, they went to King Herod and said, Hey, where is this king that's been born of the Jews? Herod didn't know anything about that, but they came and they brought gifts, and they likely took camels with them. Now, they might have not been riding on the camels, but they probably took the camels with them. Now, here's what a lot of people don't know or don't even realize. Seeing a camel at the nativity was probably not reality. It probably didn't happen. They probably showed up eight months, a year, or even more than that, after Jesus was born. So Jesus was no longer a little baby. He was probably just a little young child. And so in Matthew 2, we see this picture of the wise men coming in. And we're going to pick that up from Matthew 2. And we're going to start off with verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And here's what we're going to be talking about today. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So these wise men, or magi, they were probably people who studied the stars and knew a lot about them. There may have been two, three, or even more. We don't know how many. A lot of people think there were three because they gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But those were only the gifts that they gave. There were probably more than that as far as these wise men that traveled here to see Jesus. Now, the fact that the wise men and the camels were likely not at Jesus' birth, we do want to talk about the gifts that they brought because those are really important. We celebrate gift giving today. You give gifts to people, people give gifts to you. I'm sure that you are looking forward to probably opening a present like this on Christmas Day or maybe Christmas Eve. We have traditions that stem really from the wise men giving Jesus gifts. And they brought these valued treasures to give to Jesus. And that's why we practice gift giving. When I was a kid, we used to exchange names. I had four brothers, I have four brothers, and we exchanged names and we would buy each other gifts. Well, we had a rule that we had to spend about the same amount of money. So we spent about $10 on each other's gifts. So we made sure that if we gave somebody a gift, we were also getting a gift back. And so sometimes gift giving is kind of like an exchange, which is similar to buying your own present. Well, real gift giving is when you give a gift and not expect anything in return. When God gave his son, Jesus Christ, that we know from John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That was like God giving us a gift and not expecting anything in return. But, you know what, sometimes when we get a gift, we really want to show appreciation. Maybe on Christmas Day when you get a gift from your mom or dad or from a friend, you're going to want to give them a hug or a big thank you. But you know what, we should be able to do that with God too. We should be able to give him a gift back. He doesn't expect it, he doesn't want it, and like he doesn't need it from us. He wants us to give him a gift, though, that's really special, and that's your heart. And so this Christmas, Jesus, more than anything in this world, he wants you to give him your heart. If you haven't already given him the gift of your life or your heart, he says, I want you to believe in me and trust in me and give me your trust, and I will provide for you what you need, and I'll be your Savior. And that's what Jesus came, is to save us from our sins when he died on the cross. I don't know if you remember, way back at Easter time, we actually had a present for the Finding God Outdoors, one of our first Finding God Outdoors, and we opened it up, and it was empty. There was nothing inside. We said that was the greatest gift of all, that Jesus gave us the gift of his death on the cross and an empty tomb where he rose from the dead. You know what, though? The greatest gift that we can give back to Jesus is your life, your heart, and all you have to do is say, Jesus, I want you in my life, and I want to live for you, and I believe that you died for me. Hey, it's been a great time spending time with you this Christmas season on Finding God Outdoors. Next time we come together, it's going to be the new year, and we're going to be talking about how things are new. 
And uh, so looking forward to next week, coming back with you on Finding God Outdoors. I hope you guys have a great Christmas and a great week. Looking forward to seeing you. Merry Christmas. to remember Don, Tom, and Sandy Groon and their families in our prayers this morning in the passing of a loving husband, brother, father, grandfather, and uncle, Doug Groon, this past week. Doug passed away on Monday morning. We pray for God's love and comfort to be a constant presence surrounding them during this difficult time. Will you join me in prayer? Loving, merciful Father, we come to you this morning with hearts that are heavy. It seems like we have been under the burden of this virus for far too long. We feel the weight of loneliness, the fear of a simple cough or sore throat turning into a violent illness, the isolation of lockdowns and dangers of being out in public, the burden of unemployment and loss of wages in a way to support our families. And now, too, the unimaginable reality of the death of Doug, one of our beloved church members. Father, we beg for your mercy. We plead with you for a way out. The hope of the vaccine is close upon us, but so many unknowns surround it, Lord, that fear lingers even in the midst of hope. We put our trust in you. Colossians tells us, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. The psalmist wrote, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Isaiah tells us this is what the Lord says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Father, how great is your love that you lavish upon us, that we should be called the children of God. We are comforted in knowing that Doug was called a child of God and is now in your loving arms. We have been waiting through the season of Advent, waiting for your child to be born, the gift of Jesus given to rescue, to redeem the sins of the world. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, our time of waiting is growing shorter each day. May we continue to be focused on you, the light of the world. When our focus wanders to the distractions of the world, may we join the angel chorus and sing glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. May your favor rest on each one of us. We pray this in the name of our everlasting Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For us, a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. You will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time and on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Friends, one thing you should know as we begin our message time is that for me, alliteration always appeals. I was giving myself a pep talk this week, and I was telling myself to stop wallowing in COVID consternations, and I liked the way that sounded, and it led to me changing um, the title of the thoughts that I want to share with you today to this, combating COVID consternations with Christmas 
contemplations. I want to share with you three Christmas contemplations today and then at the end give you a bonus uh, breath prayer that is related to them. The Christmas contemplations that will help you combat COVID consternations are all focused on this verse of scripture. Luke chapter 2 verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Here's the first Christmas contemplation for our gathering of worship today. Jesus was born so that you could be born again. I saw that um, a week or so ago, and then I saw it again, that same thought. And it made me ponder, um, contemplate that concept as it related to the words from Isaiah that we've been thinking about for these past few weeks together. Jesus was born so that you could be born again. From the prophecy of Isaiah, 800 years before Jesus was born, um, we hear these words, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's easy to see now when we're looking back the connection between that prophecy of Isaiah that says, for to us a child is born, and these words from Luke chapter 2, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So our first Christmas contemplation, Jesus was born so that you could be born again. What do we mean by born again? Well, exactly what Jesus explained it to mean when he was speaking with a man named Dick Nicodemus, one of the brightest um, leaders, um, religiously and philosophically speaking of his day. And he told Nicodemus this, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus kind of played dumb and said, well, what do you mean born again? I can't go back into my mother's womb. He knew that Jesus was talking about the radical change that happens when a person is um, connected to God, part of his kingdom, and in this case, meets Jesus and follows him. It's like being born again. It's that radical, that comprehensive. It's that much of a fresh start, a new chance or a new beginning. And so Jesus was born so that you could be born again. And the key to being born again is to put your faith and trust in him. That's how we're born again. We're born again by the power that comes when Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, grows. And um, once he is um, crucified on a cross and placed in a tomb, the power of God raises him to life again. That victory over death becomes the power that allows a human being to be born again, to be radically changed from the inside out by the power of God. And so Jesus was born so that you and I could be born again. Peter puts it this way in his first letter. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Born again. Jesus was born so that you could be born again. A Christmas contemplation. Perhaps one of the benefits of COVID will be that... Um, with Christmas gatherings being much more limited than they've been before, you'll have some time to just ponder, to consider, to wonder, to contemplate. What does it mean that Jesus was born so that you could be born again? And what will be the evidence of it? Jesus said being born again means that you're born spiritually of, of um, water and the Spirit that you're cleansed and forgiven by God, that you're made new, you're made whole, um, and that you're filled with him, that there'll be something that happens to you on the inside when you're born again, and it'll affect what happens in the way you live your life on the outside. It's a complete transformation that God provides for us, being born again. The second Christmas contemplation for us to consider together is this. Why do we try to hide our sins from the only one who can save us from them? Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior 
who is Christ the Lord. We celebrate Christmas because it's the day that God sent a Savior. And what does this Savior do? He saves us from our sins. There was nothing mild about Jesus' mission coming here to earth. The baby in the manger, sweet and mild, yes. Um, but the mission that he was about was radical. It was a mission to save, to rescue, and it was a mission to eradicate. Matthew says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. How was he going to do that? He was going to defeat the devil, defeat death, and defeat darkness that had come over human hearts. He was going to eradicate sin from, um, from human beings by taking God's punishment against all that sin onto himself. This was not a mild mission. This was a magnificent mission that God had to save the world. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And so if God went through all this effort to come from heaven to earth, be born as a baby and to grow up into a man, to be crucified on a cross, placed in a tomb, and then raised from the dead in order that the world could have a savior to save us from our sins, why is it that we so often try to hide our sins from the only one who can save us from them? A Christmas contemplation. God gave us this promise. He loved the world so that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. My prayer for you today is that you believe, that you trust in God's promise, that you trust and you believe in God's son, that you won't have another Christmas go by where you have missed the true meaning of the season but that today you'd say, God, I believe, that you'd pray, Jesus, I trust in you. Show me what it means to have my sins forgiven. Show me what it means to be born again by water in the Spirit, to pray to God and have him transform your life from the inside out. A Christmas contemplation worth pursuing. And finally, a third Christmas contemplation for us today, this contemplation. Where do you need God's peace to reign over your life today? We looked at Luke chapter 2, verse 11. It was the angel speaking to the shepherds, when the angel said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. But the account and the angel's words go on to say this, Luke writes, And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, and perhaps you already know these words, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Peace. Peace is God's gift to us at Christmas through Jesus Christ. It seems sometimes that our very habits of Christmas, our routines, our traditions, that they create not peace in our hearts, but chaos in our hearts. Sometimes the season itself reminds us of our losses, of our pains, of what we're missing. But that longing can lead us right back to God who gives us peace. And sometimes receiving that peace is as simple as opening your heart. It's the same with receiving God's forgiveness. Sometimes receiving his forgiveness is as simple as opening your heart to it. And so I invite you as we're in this mode of Christmas contemplations to Consider this. Take a deep breath. Yep, right where you are. Just simply take a deep breath and exhale. And allow your body to relax, to let your guard down, and to open your heart to God's forgiving grace, which comes through Jesus Christ.
to open your heart to God's peace that passes understanding and allow it to meet those places in your soul and spirit that right now are chaotic. You see, Christmas is about miracles, supernatural miracles, that the Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, came from heaven to earth so that people like you and me could be forgiven by him and know that forgiveness, that we could receive the peace that only he can bring, the peace that Jesus breathed to his disciples is the same peace that he grants to us this day. Maybe you'll have to take a deep breath a lot of times in the next week to open your heart, relax your body, to calm your mind, and say, God, grant to me the grace that brings forgiveness. Grant to me the peace that only you can give. Fill my heart and soul. That's my prayer for you in our Christmas contemplations. Here they are by a way of review. You might have some time to consider them in the week ahead. Jesus was born so that you could be born again. Number two, why do we try to hide our sins from the only one who can save us from them? And number three, where do you need God's peace to reign over your life today? And then here's your bonus. It's for me as well. The bonus of a breath prayer. Now a breath prayer is simply a short prayer that you can pray that can be accomplished in one breath. For me, I find it most valuable if I'm walking because the rhythm of walking and breathing can create a nice sink for me um, in which um, my prayer can be prayed. So take the scripture that we considered today and try it on for size this way as a simple breath prayer. You inhale and then you pray this prayer. Make this truth. For unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Inhale, for unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. If you go for a walk today, if you're spending time alone with God, simply pray that prayer again and again. See what God brings to your mind, which word he has you focus on in your Christmas contemplations. For unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A beautiful truth that has changed the world, changed my heart, and I trust God is using to change yours. For unto you is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Will you please join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we come to you with hearts that are wide open to your love and your mercy and your grace. Oh Lord, how we need you. In anxious times, we recognize our need more and more. In the times of stress and anxiety, in the times of fear and frustration, we recognize that we need you more and more. God, we can't do this life on our own, and once we've known you, we never want to again. Forgive us when we forget that you are the way and the truth and the life. Forgive us when we settle for um, life shortchanged instead of life abundant with you. Amaze us again, O oh God, by your grace. Renew your mercies for us this morning and every morning. And God, shine your light upon our path that we might follow Jesus with all of our heart our soul, our strength, and mind. We pray this prayer in his name. And all God's people say, Amen.
redemption and the song still he chose to be written in our story so he could feel our flesh and blood and we could know his love Emmanuel a manger for a bed a crown upon his head he came like us instead without a home, helpless as a baby. So if we're feeling lost in our own lives, we are not alone. He has felt the same things because he lived in flesh and blood. We can know his love. crown upon his head he came like us instead Emmanuel he meets you where you are he holds your heavy heart our God is with us all Thank you for joining us for this time of worship and contemplation during this Christmas season. As you prepare to go and continue in your day and throughout your week, um, I want to let you know that I'm wondering what you're wondering about. And please call a text or email me and I would love to contact you and encourage you in your walk with God and your journey with Jesus. I invite you to open your hands to open your hearts and to receive God's word of blessing this day. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. May you overflow with hope through the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.